global recession is just around the corner. Welcome to this DW Business Special on what we can expect. I'm Ben Fazulin in Berlin, and I'm joined by economist Karsten Bozinski from the ING Bank. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Well, let's whiz through the numbers before we get started. The International Monetary Fund is warning that over a third of the world economy is headed for contraction this year or next. China, the Eurozone and the United States will continue to stall. The IMF says this year's shocks will reopen economic wounds that were only partially healed post-pandemic. Its world economic outlook shows growth withering from 6% last year and 3.2% this year to just 27 next year. One factor is that central banks are hiking interest rates to ease inflation. That's taking the heat out of domestic demand. But of course, you've also got the war in Ukraine. It sparked an energy crisis. It's also blocked food supplies, driving up prices. And there's China's zero COVID strategy that's hit trade hard. It also faces a property market crisis. We'll also look at the UK economy, also on the brink of recession and its political crisis, as well as how the Russian economy is faring almost eight months into its war. The IMF has stressed throughout this week's meetings of finance chiefs that the priority is for governments to keep budgets tight and for central banks to tighten monetary policies to control inflation. I asked an IMF official about that. The number one challenge is to tame this inflation, which is at multi-decade highs. And we do think that they are doing the right thing by raising rates around the world. This is an unprecedented amount of monetary tightening, but it's necessary to do the job of, of bringing inflation down now. If they allow this problem to fester and e uh, tap off the, you know, ease off the brakes, then we could have a much uh, harder job later on bringing inflation under control. Well, Carsten, how bad a recession is this going to be? What sort of job are we all uh, facing right now? Well, I think we see a different shape of recession, if you're honest. Also, when you look at these, these IMF numbers, um, so we see more or less the cyclical recession triggered by higher interest rates that we're going to see in the U.S., and then we see uh, recessions um, that are more severe because they're also more structurally driven. That is what we're seeing in China, where there's a structural issue with the property market. But that's also what we see in a, mainly in Europe, where we have an ongoing energy crisis, an ongoing war, and, and an entire region which has benefited tremendously over the last decades from globalization and world trade, and which will now really be kind of squeezed from two sides, high energy prices and a structural change to, uh, to globalization. We had it easy for a long time with interest rates historically low and uh, for such a long time. Interest rates are set to go up even further, though, and stay up there for quite some time. How much suffering will that create? Well, a, a lot of suffering, and we already see this, that every change comes with suffering. Any, every adjustment comes with suffering. That's what we're currently seeing in financial markets to start with. And there is ongoing turmoil in equity markets, in bond markets, because markets have to adjust to this new reality of lower growth, higher inflation, and higher interest rates. But also we citizens um, will notice it. Higher interest rates means that it will be uh, much less affordable to buy a house. It also means uh, taking up credits, taking up a loan will become much more expensive. So we will see that these higher interest rates, even though we have an inflation which is mainly driven by energy prices, we are now seeing central banks trying to slow down the demand side, slowing down consumption, slowing down investment, and that's going to be painful. But those higher interest rates are going to stifle demand. So at some stage, we're going to be faced with this problematic of trying to get demand back up there as well. Indeed. And that is, of course, also a bit the, the contradictory thing that we see in Western economies from Western governments right now, how they try to tackle inflation or higher energy prices. Because here we see that governments have started to support um, the demand side of the economy. They have started to uh, support households' disposable incomes. There are subsidies given. There are also there will be support for companies. So this is actually where the government enters the picture. It will not help bringing down inflation, but it's at least stabilizing the demand side. 
Um, the other thing, of course, that could happen is that central banks at some point in time notice that they actually were too aggressive and that they actually got carried away in their task to bring down inflation so that we will see rates, interest rates being cut again. And I personally think that we will see the U.S., the Fed, cutting interest rates in the second half of next year already. OK, but not this year, because the jobs market there is looking very strong. And I mean, uh, the more jobs going around, uh, the higher wages could be pushed up and the higher inflation goes. Correct. And that is also a very interesting thing of this specific recession in the industrialized countries, because this is a recession which hopefully will not leave um, big marks on the labor market because we have this structural shift of demographics, aging. There is already this demand of uh, qualified workers in the U.S., in Europe. So even when the demand side comes down now, I think we will not see a big surge in unemployment. What we're going to see is clearly an impact on the wage demands. So I would expect that we will see on the back of higher interest rates, on the back of the recession, that we'll also see that wage growth will come down. And this is obviously a trend, a development that central banks really would like to see and would appreciate. Because if it doesn't, um, as the managing director of the IMF has pointed out, uh, runaway inflation could take hold and then there are the knock-on effects for poverty and hunger, for example. I want to be, to be clear, the reason we are uh, endorsing a uh, strong focus on inflation is because inflation has been quite stubborn and the risk of inflation expectations de-anchoring uh, has become uh, more uh, uh, visible. We cannot we cannot possibly allow inflation to become an, a runaway uh, train. Bad for growth and bad for people. Bad, as, bad especially for poor, for, pe for poor people. And we need stronger efforts to confront food insecurity. 345 million people are acutely food insecure. What it means is that their children and women and men are at risk of dying because of hunger. Well, parts of the world, Karsten, were already facing a hunger crisis. Has it just got worse? Of course it has, and she is fully right. So we have this high inflation, high energy prices, high food prices. These two are obviously related to each other. So we are that, and what in some Western economies might only be a financial issue is in many other countries an issue of life and death. And that is only the price element. So don't, don't forget, I think, what, what, we, what is not, ex, let's say, adequately in all these forecasts is the fact that we have this ongoing war in Ukraine, that the Ukraine is extremely important for, uh, important for food production. So I'm a bit afraid that we will not only see this price effect, but we will also see a food supply problem going into 2023. And this would make this poverty, the hunger issue, the famine issue, even more severe. Um, to bring this uh, back to uh, the personal level for so many people around the world, not just those facing hunger and even worse, um, Carsten, you mentioned it before, the state has been bailing out the people rather than banks. A huge development when it comes to equity around the world uh, and equality. Tell me, the state has only just spent an entire pandemic bailing out the people. Is it going to be able to continue that? Will it be able to afford that? That is a very good question. And uh, when you look at financial markets in recent weeks, and particularly what happened in, in the UK, when the UK government announced a big fiscal stimulus package, and all of a sudden we saw bond yields going through the roof, as a reaction that financial markets seemed to doubt the, um, the fiscal sustainability of the British government, it shows us that there are limits to what governments can spend. I think to put it into, into perspective, in Europe, but I'm also taking the US into account, that the Western economies during the pandemic, they spent between 10 and 15% of their GDP to stimulate and support the economies during the pandemic. So we're currently seeing all countries individually trying to support households, trying to support, uh, support businesses, and it amounts to something like 
five to six percent of GDP. Does this mean that there is still more room to do more? It could. It could also mean that there are limits to what governments can actually do in the current crisis if they don't want to be hit by much higher interest rates and by being punished by financial markets, as it means that investors would be withdrawing their money from these countries that spent too much to support their economies. Well, let's stay with the British government. You brought that up. Um, the government's very new, um, but it went the way of uh, spending up big and, and tax cuts that seem to be unfunded, according to analysts. That's what was causing the market turmoil and has now cost the job of the finance minister. Let's just listen in to the debate a little earlier in the week. We are seeing interest rates rising globally. We are doing, they are rising globally in the face of Putin's appalling war in Ukraine. And what we're making sure is that we protect our economy at this very difficult time internationally. We will see higher growth and lower inflation. Lost in denial. No wonder investors have no confidence in her government. Who voted for this? Who voted for this? There's no point. There's no point. When will she stop ducking responsibility, do the right thing and reverse her kamikaze budget, which is causing so much pain? Mr Speaker, I think the last thing we need is a general election. Under fire in the House of Commons, British Prime Minister Liz Truss this week facing lawmakers for the first time since her tax-cutting mini-budget caused turmoil on the markets and sent the pound plunging. Carsten, uh, let's bring you back in. Is this what happens to countries that get it wrong? Because so much of the world is moving in the same direction right now as far as governments and uh, their relationship to central banks go. Um, is this what happens when they get it wrong? They, uh, they get punished, do they? I, I think this is indeed what happens if they go it wrong. It also happens... Um, now, in the case of the UK, probably if you are no longer under the umbrella of a bigger continent. I think that that might have also played a role here because the UK is really on its own. And I think what uh, the biggest mistake here were, were, the, were the tax cuts. Now, the idea is actually not too bad. So what did the government do? The government tried to support the demand side, tried to support uh, incomes and companies. I think we see other countries doing the same. Um, but what they should have done instead of cutting taxes would have been, for example, an investment program, an investment program showing that they aim at improving the uh, potential growth of the economy, in investing in uh, infrastructure, investing in energy supply, because I think that is what is currently needed. And I don't want to be in, in the shoes of any politician right now, because it is extremely difficult to make the right decisions. They try to square the circle here. You need to bring short-term relief to your economy while at the same time bring trans um, structural transition on track. And that is very difficult. Well, it's also about uh, ensuring access to credit, isn't it? And, and not so widespread, but also targeted credit to groups that need it most, so the more vulnerable and the poor. That is... That is exactly what it is. Um, but then we see that apparently governments are overwhelmed by the speed of this crisis, that sometimes technically, well, think of Germany, it is impossible to, to give more targeted stimulus because, I don't know, due to privacy reasons, due to the lack of digitalization. But of course, ideally, this fiscal support would be extremely tailor-made to the ones who need it the most, so the ones with low incomes, um, the companies that are at the brink of going bust, and then at the same time target the supply side. Think about what does your economy need in the coming years? How do you change the energy supply? Uh, this requires time, patience, but also big investments. And uh, we seem to be running out of time. Carsten, uh, as a chief economist, how do you build strong fundamentals in a shock-prone world? But also, how do you do it overnight? You can't do it overnight because we have democracies um, and there is discussion, and discussion these days simply took, uh, takes too long. Um, I think the, um, the only thing that you can criticize here is that many governments somehow didn't see that coming, even though since February 24th, it was obvious 
that we're going to be heading into an energy crisis in Europe, um, that Europe is going to lose, inter lose international competitiveness, and that governments uh, should have reacted earlier than they did currently. And that energy crisis, thanks to Russia, uh, it's very interesting to look at the numbers right now and see how Russia is seemingly faring better than expected, considering its war in Ukraine. Faring better, um, not faring well. That's uh, important. But what happened, obviously, um, th there are sanctions, which only gradually start to bite. And then there's energy exports. And yes, there is less energy export. There's less export in oil and gas, but prices have gone through the roof. So this is what still helps the Russian economy to get these revenues and to support the economy. But let's not forget. Uh, so Russia is experiencing a severe recession. It's only not as severe as many analysts had thought at the start of the war. Carson, what about the complexity for developing economies, finally? Extremely complex. We touched upon the high food prices. This is a, this is a severe issue for, um, for emerging economies. We also see that uh, with this change in interest rates, so with central banks hiking interest rates, there is also an inflow in capital, especially to the US. So that is capital that goes out of, of emerging markets, capital that is, uh, that is urgently needed to bring investments into emerging economies and in order to bring up, to bring up the economic potential of, of these economies. So we will see, and that's actually what we, we always saw that, in, in periods of aggressive interest rate hikes in the US, Emerging markets very often suffered. It might be a bit different this time around. There will be more diversification. I think we need to distinguish between the emerging markets, the ones with relatively stable political systems, plus the ones exporting commodities should do relatively well. The others will probably really be hit a lot by this complete paradigm shift that we see in the global economy. Well, it has to be different this time round, doesn't it? I mean, we're not in the same position we were prior to the 2008 financial crisis. Banks are so much more robust, regulation is tighter. And as we've mentioned, governments aren't bailing out banks, they're bailing out the people. Dan, I think some, if there is something that we all have learned over the last decade, it is you know always be extremely cautious believing an economist telling you that this time is different. Um, it, it might somehow be different, um, but you know that it is never really completely different. Uh, when you look back at his economic history since World War II, uh, every single recession was triggered by aggressive rate hikes globally, and that is something we're happy, we're also witnessing right now uh, for for justified reasons. But, but it's always every recession has been kind of, uh, you know, been advanced by, by strong rate hikes. This is happening now. How this will play out, you're fully right. This is not the financial crisis again. The financial system is much more stable than in the past. We learned our lessons. But there will always be ways through which this shift in policies, this shift in monetary policy will find its way into the global economy. And that is what we're currently seeing. That is what the IMF is predicting. The IMF is not predicting the end of the world. That's also very clear. The IMF is predicting a slowdown, a slowdown that, that will see recession, technical recession in many regions. But the IMF is also not predicting a kind of gloom and doom slowdown, which leads to mass unemployment in many countries. This is not what's going to happen. Lastly, can you... Give us a, a little bit of hope to finish on. How, how much hope is there that governments and central banks will together tame inflation, master this recession, and perhaps cushion it for all of us? Well, I think to take away hope as a starter, I think there, with these situations, there is always the risk of overshooting. So there is always the risk of making a policy mistake by hindsight. Um, the optimistic, the hope is clearly um, that this change now in interest rates um, also means that there is, you know, we, we have imbalances in the global economies. We had imbalances and, and excessive trends in parts of financial markets. So this should lead to some normalization. What it also means, if governments do it right, 
So if governments do not only caution the short-term impact of the recession, but use this recession as, as a means and as a trigger to really get this energy transition going, which means longer-term structural change, then it could bring innovation, could bring new investment, could bring forward um, renewable energies. So this is the hope that I'm having, not in the short term, but at least in the medium term, that this is finally a crisis, and we heard this so often, that this is a crisis which will make the global economy better, unfortunately, only after a couple of years. Some hope there for the people and the planet from Carsten Brzezewski, Chief Economist, ING Germany. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us for this DW Business Special. And thank you for watching. There's plenty more from the business team on the DW News YouTube channel. Until next time, take care.